Oh, hi. Thought I was taking a still picture for a second. Anyway, um, so this is a project that I've been wanting to do for quite a while, and I finally decided, you know what, let's just do it. You know, some folks like to go online, use social media, Google searches to find out, you know, where their ex-girlfriends, boyfriends, or partners, where are they today? You know, they're doing well in life, but what about Susie, who I dated when I was in my early 20s? Whatever happened to Susie? You know, is she, is she still working over at the, uh, at the pillow factory, or, or what happened to her, you know? So, you go on social media, and you look up, you know, Susie Cream Cheese, and sure enough, she's now the manager of the pillow factory, and she's doing quite well. She has three kids, she's on her third husband, and she uh, may or may not have a drug addiction. But the bottom line is, there's that question of what about the people in my life who I've moved on from, or what about how's my old house doing? You know, you buy a house or you rent an apartment and you live in there for a couple of years and you move on with your life, you go elsewhere. But what about your vehicles? You ever thought about your old vehicles? Are they still on the road? Did they get crushed? Was I, was I, was I hasty in my decision to get rid of that particular vehicle when I did because I thought it was going to break down imminently and leave me with a very, very expensive repair bill. Well, I'll be honest with you guys. I haven't dated a ton of people in my life. In fact, I've been with the same woman for now six years. So I have owned a billion vehicles. I have owned more vehicles than the average used car lot sells in a month. I have owned a lot of cars. I'm only 39, but at, at, at last count, I think I'm up to um, my 17th uh, vehicle since I got my license just prior to September 11th of 2001. Yes, I got my, my license on 9-6-2001. And... So for some people that may not seem here. Let me let me actually pull up the exact uh, uh, the exact number here. I I actually keep a data a spreadsheet. I've owned seventeen cars and five motorbikes <laughs> since I got my first car. Uh, it's a little excessive, I think. Now the thing is, in order to find out how many of these old vehicles that I've owned in the past are still on the road, I need some way to identify them and I need a way to look them up and pull some kind of records. Well, that's where Carfax uh, comes into play. This video is not sponsored by Carfax. As a matter of fact, I have a dispute with them right now. We'll get into that one later. Um, but I decided, you know what? I have VIN numbers for at least five of my previous vehicles and through sheer luck I have a VIN number for one of my motorbikes that I owned for quite some time. I generally don't keep old records in my filing cabinet because why? I didn't think I would be doing this years and years later. The good news is I do have VIN numbers now for the ones that I was more curious about than anything else. Okay, so um, there are two particular vehicles that I was the most curious about. And thankfully, through sheer luck and determination, I got the VIN numbers. I actually had to go in person to the dealership who sold these vehicles to me um, originally. And they just happened to be able to pull the records, but I had to show an ID. I never thought of a VIN number as a protected piece of information, but according to this dealership, I could apparently do some kind of fraud by getting a VIN number for a 2007 Nissan Versa that may or may not still be on the road, but that's a good jumping off point for vehicle number one. So like I said, I have owned 17 cars. I've made videos about these cars in the past. And I'll just run down the list here. 
uh, 1 through 17. <clears throat> so the first car I owned was a 1987 Volkswagen GTI. Now I did actually confirm that that vehicle was crushed and I actually know which salvage yard ended up with it. I traded that car in for a 97 Mazda 626. Once again, we know for a fact that vehicle was crushed and totaled because it was in a car accident. I was in a car accident. Not my fault, but that's what happened to it. I then owned a 1970 Pontiac Tempest. Don't know. That car is probably still around. Um, it was a collector car when I had it, and it was sold to a collector. So chances are that car, um, which I acquired in September of 2003 and got rid of in um, June of 05, it's probably out there somewhere. That car was actually a gift from my grandfather who recently passed away. I kind of wish I still had that one. but Then I got an 87 Nissan pickup truck. I owned it for less than six months. That truck has been scrapped as well. I know that for a fact. 1987 Nissan Pathfinder, acquired in May of 2004, sold it in two of 2005. That one, once again, there's very little chance that that is still on the road. It was probably destroyed. 89 Nissan Maxima, I don't know why I got this one. It was just kind of a, a third vehicle for me at the time. I didn't own that one very, I owned it for almost a year, surprisingly. Um, but that one was, uh, that one also was scrapped, um, I know for sure. Now we get into some of the newer vehicles that I've owned. Uh, for example, I had a 1999 Nissan Sentra. I owned it for about half a year. And um, it was actually in great condition when I got rid of it. Um, had like 80,000 miles on it. And uh, I then bought a 2004 Nissan Frontier. I bought it in May of 05, sold it in J January of 07. Now we get into our first vehicle that I actually have, the VIN num a VIN number four. This was my first brand new car. It was a 2007 Nissan Versa SL. Um, it was a new model at the time. And it was one of the first ones that was sold by this particular dealer. Um, I was one of the first people to own a Nissan Versa in New Hampshire. <laughs> I was kind of an early adopter. Um, this particular car, um, I actually kind of liked. It was, it was a new car, so it didn't have like a, <coughs> a sorted past or anything or anything that I really had to worry about. It was brand new. Um, it was the options I wanted. It was the color I wanted. It was a nice car. Um, and the Nissan Versa hadn't really developed a reputation uh, for being the king of JD by Rider by that point. It was still a, like I said, it was a new model, new car. I bought the car uh, in January of 07. It was traded in, uh, it was a, what I traded the pickup truck in for. I bought the car because I needed something that was more, um, I, I, I was driving a, a pickup truck and I needed something that had more um, dry storage and I, I was looking for something in a hatchback. I obviously love Nissans and um, I figured what the hell, you know, how could you go wrong with a Nissan? Oh, I was wrong. The car was pretty reliable. Um, the only issue I, I recall with this vehicle was the air conditioner compressor was very, very noisy. And it was noisy and it was, um, so I brought it into the dealer under warranty and they charged me to evacuate and test the system. That was red flag number one. They agreed to replace the compressor under warranty, and then they did, in fact, I believe, refund me for the uh, diagnostic of the of the problem because it was warranty repair, and it turned out it was a problem. So, where is it today? So I traded that car in for the Nissan Murano, and um, well. <laughs> The reason I got rid of the car was because it was um, starting to develop a few quirks. The um, 
the it had by the time I got rid of it, it, had, it was just under sixty thousand miles. It was still under a factory warranty for the powertrain, and um, I never really had any engine problems. It did start to consume oil, despite the fact that I maintain my vehicles better than better than most. Um, but the transmission, the CVT transmission, was starting to act a little bit erratic. It was shifting a little differently. You could just feel it in the drive line. It was like, okay, something is wearing out in this car. And I wanted to get rid of it before the warranty was up. So I decided, you know what? And, and the biggest reason I got rid of this car was because it no longer... I, I, start, I, I moved out into the country at this point, and I was actually living on a mountain like well not a mountain mountain but it was all uphill and the um the little nissan versa just did not do well in snow the tire profile was all wrong the um it was it was geared for you know uh, efficiency the cbt transmission had a habit of locking up if the wheels ever slipped so the tires were spinning and the CVT would upshift automatically if you forgot to down, like lock it into second or low, whatever it was. Bottom line, the car just was ill-equipped for my commute and it was starting to develop suspension bushing noises, which are common for that car. And the CVT was starting to kind of wear out a little bit. So I made the decision to trade it in for a used Nissan Murano. Where is the Versa today? Well, I have the Carfax right here. I bought a six pack of Carfaxes and I'm trying to get credit for number six. And once again, we'll talk about that later. Uh, so it does have a reported accident, which I know because that was me. I caused it, I'll admit it. Um, it was a very minor collision, about $5,000 in damage. So this Carfax reports it as uh, being delivered to the dealer on December of 06. That checks out because uh, the car was made in December of 06. I remember that definitely. Uh, built, by the way, in Agos Calientes, Mexico. All right. I purchased it on 1-9 of 06 with 26 miles. Now, Carfax does correctly report a front-end uh, passenger side collision doesn't really talk about anything else there's, there's so this was a, a dealer serviced vehicle and not really any of that was ever reported to Carfax so if you were expecting your Carfax report to contain detailed records it depends on when the car was serviced like what year because at some point they weren't really reporting this stuff also depends on where not all dealerships apparently have a relationship with Carfax but it does reflect that I sold the car with 57,000 miles on May 15th of 09. Uh, or May 13th. Or was it May 2nd? I don't know. 57,000 miles exactly. Um, May 17th, it magically grew 800 miles. So according to Carfax, this car moved 823 miles in two days okay <laughs> and then magically uh on six five it had fifty eight thousand exactly like all right so maybe they're just guessing i guess okay where do we go from here so the car was uh so i bought it in uh, manchester registered in bennington um and it now ended up in Fremont somehow. Then it was sold, uh, looks like it was sold again in 2011, or no, serviced, sorry, in 2011 at a Suzuki dealership. And it shows me when the tires were changed at 105. This car actually made it back to the selling dealer with 109,000 miles. And uh, it was actually, so that's its second owner. It was actually sold again in 2012 with 111,489 miles. And its last record 
was at 127,000 miles for an oil and filter change. It looks like it might have some open recalls, but what this tells me is my beloved Nissan Versa that I owned for nearly 60,000 miles is now off the road. And it looks like it made it all the way until, two, what year did I say it was, 2015? 2015, no, no, 2013, 2013. So the car made it 127,000 miles at least. And it was just under seven years, so it's a little over six years old. Wow, that's sad. Now, the, the real kicker here is if I kept this Nissan Versa and I drove the miles that I was driving, it wouldn't have lasted that long. I assume that 127,000 miles, it suffered a major mechanical failure. Transmission. And um, if I had kept that car, it probably wouldn't have lasted very long. So I'm going to, because because I was putting about, by the time I moved out to the woods, <laughs> I was doing an easy 28,000 miles a year. So I probably would have gotten maybe two years more out of it. I would not have been able to pay the car off. Like, the car would not have been paid off because I took a six-year loan on that car. I was poor and not very financially wise. Two bad combinations. And, I, yeah, I, I, I took out a ridiculous loan on this car, and it would not have survived the loan term. I know that much. Because I would have put 60,000 miles on it in two years. It only made it. So how much does a transmission cost for a Nissan Versa? I actually did ask this very question, and they told me at the time it was around five grand, or 6,000, no, 6,000, I think. So did I make the right choice by getting rid of this car? Well, I'm going to say yes. All right. So Versa, off the road, case closed. All right. Let's go see what's next. Now for this next one. This one's a doozy. Now, I've been I've been teased mercilessly about this particular vehicle by one of my fellow vintage computer hobbyists. Uh, we'll just call him Retro Tech Chris. Um, it's all good. So this next vehicle actually shocked me. Now I'm going to do these in the order in which I owned them. So I wanted to save this one for the end, but eh, doesn't matter. 2006 Nissan Murano. This, uh, I bought this because I wanted something a little bit more, um, capable of climbing hills in the snow and the all-wheel drive capabilities of the 2006 Nissan Murano fit the bill. And uh, I bought mine, I was the second owner. It had, uh, according to Carfax, it had like 67,000 miles, 67,789. So, not too bad. I knew damn well the Muranos were known for their transmission and uh, transfer case problems, but when you're young and stupid, you tend to overlook those things. That's why a lot of young people buy Mercedes Benzes and BMWs that are, you know, three, four owners into their life. <laughs> so, because you, you don't make the best decisions when you're young. You just want to look cool. And the Murano. I'll say it, you know, it, it was one of the most beautiful products Nissan ever built, and I'll die on that hill. It was a beautiful car inside and out. I love the interior. I love the exterior. Um, it was just a uh, gorgeous car. Sorry, SUV. Uh, compact SUV. And uh, a little birdie told me it was built on the Altima platform, of all things, so, you know, a uh, big Altima energy, as they say. The Altimas don't have a great reputation either. Now, I want to emphasize, this was at a time in Nissan's history 
when they hadn't yet developed their current reputation um, of once again being the king of JD by rider lots, they were actually uh, decent vehicles. They really were. People didn't really know just how bad the engineering was because the vehicles that were that pioneered some of their worst ideas were still fairly new, low mileage vehicles. But what really kills me, well, let's get into it. I, I am, I am, this, this report really blows my mind. I cannot believe what I'm reading here. I almost feel like the VIN number was taken off and put it on another one. This is just sketchy because I'm just going to say it. So I bought it uh, with 67,000 miles. I got rid of it when it started falling apart. Now it was falling apart. Like this car was turning into a lemon at roughly, uh, let's see, there's, there's the second owner, that's me, purchased in 09. It had 108,000 miles, although I thought I put more than that on it, but I guess not. It had about 108, 500 miles when I got rid of it. And the, at this point, the following had occurred. The driver's side seat frame collapsed. It's a known problem um, due to the design of the seat frame um, mounting brackets. Uh, they're prone to metal fatigue. Like when you're driving your car, that seat frame is constantly flexing a little bit. It's yielding just a little bit as you're going around corners, as you're accelerating, decelerating. And it doesn't take a lot to allow metal fatigue to set in. And I wasn't a very heavy person, but the person before me may have been. So I, I don't know. But the heavier you are, the more likely this is to happen. But it's almost guaranteed to occur on all first generation Muranos. It is such a common problem that Dormer actually makes a replacement part for this seat frame that did not exist when I owned mine. I had to pay a thousand dollars to buy an entire seat base assembly, motors and all, for about ten dollars worth of metal. That's just the way things are in the auto industry. But nowadays, you can buy a dormer part to fix this, by the way. So that happened. The sun visor, the, dri the driver's side sun visor, suffered another known Nissan-wide problem where the, uh, the metal clips that hold the visor in position, they're like little spring clips, um, they failed. They broke. And the sun visor was just kind of flopping around. So I had to buy a brand new sun visor because you can't get them in the junkyards because it's, it's such a common problem that the ones in the junkyard are already broken. So I had to buy a new sun visor. That was $350. I went through two sets of brakes. I owned the car for nearly 30,000 miles. I went through like two sets of brakes. The brakes that were on it when I bought it were new, and then I had to replace them like 20,000 miles later. I mean, I was like, I was having a time with this car. It was, it was starting to really piss me off. And um, to top it all off, I started to notice a crunching sound. Now, once again, I maintain my vehicles and the vehicle struck me as well-maintained. Like it appeared to be well-maintained when I bought it. But it started to develop another known Actually, three more problems that are notorious problems on the Murano. Number one, timing chain guides. So these engines were known for throwing timing chain guides. Um, and they would develop a rattle on startup, the VQ35DE. So the solution for this is to um, pull the engine <laughs> and take the timing chains off and replace them. Replace the chains, replace the tensioners, replace the guides. That's the correct fix for this problem. I just kind of let it slide because I'm not paying to have an engine pulled on a car that I just bought like a year prior and um, owed a ton of money on. I paid 20000 for the car. And, um, you know, I, I was in debt to this car for quite a bit. So that was my problem, being young and stupid. Now, timing chains, okay, then there was the, the motor mounts. Um, they were starting to... Um, 
Well, there was a known problem with the Muranos and the Maximus, I believe, with their active powered motor mounts. They're known for shorting out and pulling down the ECU at the same time. That was in the back of my mind. <sighs> what else? Oh, yeah. Um, there was another known issue uh, with the uh, transfer case. And they would develop kind of a grinding sound if you're coasting. You can usually hear it when you're coasting alongside a fence or a building. And it sounds like if you take a, a flexi straw and you, 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 you expand it and compress it, like <laughs> it makes this weird sound. Just picture a flexi straw and like you just pull it apart. Now imagine that repeatedly doing that. So that was, uh, I believe, the transfer case chain dragging. Um, then there was the CBT that wasn't really acting up, but Nissan was compelled to extend the warranty on those for 120,000 or so miles. So all of these red flags started popping up, and I realized I probably should have just bought a Corolla. It <laughs> just ended my vehicle troubles there, but no, no, no. So when I got rid of this car uh, in 11, 2010, like I got rid of this car in uh, late 2010. Yeah, there she is. 108, 584. When I got rid of it, um, it has had three owners, no, two additional owners after me. And would you believe it, it made it to 222,578 miles. Now, of all the cars I've ever owned to, that I would have expected to reach that kind of mileage, the 2006 Murano was not one of them. Not one of them. I, I never in a million years would have ever thought this car would have made it to a buck 50. I had it written off at 120. Oh, the last straw for this car was when the uh, the blower motor quit working. At completely quit working. I could I had no heat. It was December, and I didn't. I was so angry with this car at this point that I overlooked the fact that it could have been a simple thirty dollar relay, which is what it was. Um, and I just said the hell with it. I traded it in on a brand new Hyundai Elantra GLS. I went from a Murano, a loaded Murano, to a stripper model Hyundai Elantra GLS. That's how angry I was with this car. Now, in that 222,578 miles, by the way, this car did end up switching states. It is now in Worcester, Mass. That's where its last record was. Um, so let's just go back over, back over there for a sec. The last inspection, the last state in now Massachusetts does yearly inspections, I believe. Um, registration, safety, 15, 16. Yeah, so they do yearly inspections in Massachusetts. So the last one was in 1017 of 2016. After that, it fell off the face of the earth. So it lasted, shockingly, almost, what, five more years? give or take, five, about five years since I got rid of it. And it went to 222. I imagine that whoever bought this car used it for highway use. Uh, th this is not CD driving. This is a highway car at this point um, to pack on that kind of miles in such a short time. My God, it's just crazy. I don't know how. I don't know how. No idea. Uh, but there is no record of destruction or, or salvage or anything like that. So that's kind of surprising to me. All right. That one's in the books. Now, this next one, the 2010 Hyundai Elantra GLS, this one was another surprise to me. This was actually probably the most problematic car I've ever owned. And, um, and this one was, I bought it new. I traded in the Murano. I bought this because it... Literally, the 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty idea kind of roped me in because I was packing miles on my car, and I didn't want to have to pay for major repairs. And I knew that no matter what I bought, something major could break, unless I bought a Toyota, God forbid. I, I don't like Toyotas, just so you know. I, I'm not a Toyota guy, not my thing. 
Um, but bottom line, uh, the, the Elantra GLS, I bought it brand new. It was regatta blue, and um, I actually like I okay. I love the Elantra GLS. It was a dead simple car. It had all the features I needed and nothing more. Power windows, power locks, cruise, ABS. Believe it or not, these were all options at one point on vehicles. It got excellent gas mileage. It went from like 20 miles per gallon to 30. And it was just a dead simple nothing car. And, and that's what I really appreciated about the Elantra because it was just... A vehicle it was it was just a means to an end it had air conditioning and everything worked <laughs> everything worked and everything was under warranty so I bought it on 11 12 12 let's see 12 8 of 2010 it was the day I bought it had 14 miles on the odometer regatta blue over tan interior it was actually a very nice color combination and aside from the fact that it was a bottom of the barrel sedan, I didn't care. I just didn't care. Anyway, so um, the uh, Elantra GLS. Now, this is where things start getting a little dicey with Carfax. And um, this is where I kind of started losing faith in what Carfax has to offer. So the problem is, it's not what's included in. It's not what's included in the Carfax. It's what's not included in the Carfax. So, here's the thing. The least reliable vehicle I think I've ever owned was the Elantra GLS. And despite all that, I still liked the car for what it was. Kind of a weird situation to be in. It's like, I love you, but I also hate you. Um, things started off pretty badly with that Elantra GLS. The transmission um, was starting to malfunction actually the day I drove it off the lot, like drove it home. Um, it was shifting erratically into second or third gear. It was like you could feel it jolt into third. And I'm thinking, well, you know, it's a new car, new transmission. It has to learn, you know, whatever. And I really didn't think much of it until I uh, put about maybe 15 or so thousand miles on the car. And I brought it back and I said, look, I've given this car some time to kind of break in and it's still malfunctioning and um, they did not disagree with me they test drove it and they said yep there's a problem and that shows up on the Carfax report at 14,000 miles and 14,015 miles and let's see what we got here maintenance inspection maintenance maintenance okay so 14,000 miles the transmission was replaced but it's not on the Carfax and it's not that Carfax sucks. It has more to do with the dealer or the manufacturer not reporting to Carfax what they've done. Like they're not saying that a major component was replaced. And again, this is where I kind of have a problem with Carfax. Yes, you. Um, I have a problem with, with the, what? Oh, you don't want me to badmouth your company? I'm not. I'm. I'm really just. I'm really just telling the audience that, you know, maybe it's not your fault. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's the dealer. You know, yeah, you think so? Okay. Well, all right. Why don't you go um, go play with the cat? Okay. All right. So the problem is, the manufacturers and the dealers aren't reporting that a major warranty replacement of a major component was completed. Um, so let's, let's dial it back a bit. So the car started to malfunction or the transmission malfunctioned, uh, fairly early in the car's life. They agreed they, had, but this shows up as a transmission fluid flush. So if you're reading this Carfax and you're at 
let's say the dealer provides you a Carfax for a used car that you want to buy. And you're looking it over and you see something like a transmission flush. Oh my god, Oreo. It's sniffing the fox, thinking it's real. Okay. Um, lost my train of thought. So if you see a transmission flush at 14,000 miles, that's probably a red flag. Uh, maybe put that in your in your uh, in your brain and remember, try to remember that next time you buy a used car. But anyway, so 14,000 miles, it was replaced, and um, the problems didn't end there. I had uh, let's see, do, 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 do. Let's see, 34,000. The nice thing about this particular dealer is they reported every single maintenance, every almost every oil change um, to Carfax as it happened. Oil change, oil change, oil change. I mean, they're reporting every single one. It's crazy. Every time they mounted the ballast tires, every time I had it aligned, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty, um, uh, what's the word, complete. Like all inclusive package. Automatic transmission flushed again at 46,000 miles. But between you and I, that was a transmission replacement because guess what? It started acting up again. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, good times. Um, now, let me ask you a question. If you're buying a used car, would you want to know if the engine and or transmission were replaced? Would you want to know that? I would. And it would actually affect my decision making when it comes to buying that vehicle. So this is kind of eye opening. Not many people are running car faxes on cars they either currently or have previously owned. To run three car fax reports cost about $65. Individually, they're $44, I think. Um, so nobody's going to chunk down that kind of change to run a Carfax on a vehicle they don't even own or, or will never see again. It doesn't, it defies logic. But it's kind of good sometimes to, I'm glad I'm doing this because it, it's eye-opening. It shows you, because I know the vehicle's history better than Carfax. I know the history better than its last three owners. It's had four owners. <laughs> four owners. So I know the entire history of this car. Carfax does not. Oh, and there's another mistake, by the way. We'll get in that in a minute. But the point is, major repairs were made to this car at the selling dealer, and they were never reported. And how would you know? if you're Even if you got the car inspected by a mechanic, they wouldn't necessarily know. I guess a good thorough test drive and a third party inspection are definitely, this is a good case to be made for that. It definitely is. Um, it just hit me. A lot of these remand components from the manufacturer will have tags on them that say remanufactured. So the, the, a, a good mechanic would be able to tell. So I take that back. Brake light switch replaced under a warrant. Uh, sorry, a um, that was a recall at fifty-seven eight thousand miles. Now, there this car also had a valve cover gasket failure, which is noted in here as just a repair, and it also suffered a um, HVAC control panel failure. Uh, it was actually just a light bulb, but they had to replace the entire assembly. And that is noted in here as well. This is ugly. Damage to rear of car. Accident report. 1-3 of 2014. So here's what happened. Um, we were involved by we. I mean, me and one of my friends were in the car in the winter on uh, January 3rd, 2014. We were actually picking up dinner from, for some other friends who were having a kind of a gathering at their house and it was during a snowstorm and I had to stop short because of a hazard in front of me. So I stopped and then the car behind me stopped shorter, like short of my car. They were then rear ended and my car was 
when I, I let me let me demonstrate the the severity of this impact. We're going to use this stapler here, and we're going to use this tape. Oh wait, I got better props. We're going to use this Volkswagen and this time machine. Which car should I be in? Well, I actually owned one of these, so I'll. This is this is how it went down. Do 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 do. Woo. Just like that. It was just enough of an impact for us to feel it like like that. It was nothing. There was no damage to the car, not at all. And the time machine failed to make it back to 1985. Um, yeah. So okay, it was like so. If I am looking at buying a used car, right? And I'm trying to choose between the 2010 Hyundai Elantra that I owned previously and an equal identical 2010 Hyundai Elantra. And someone told me in my, in my previous uh, experiences to never buy an accident car. Don't ever buy a car that was in an accident because you don't know how thorough and proper the repairs are made. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to look at this well-maintained Hyundai Elantra. Let's pretend the transmission issues never occurred. And I'm going to say, you know what? This was in an accident. Carfax says so. So I'm going to either offer way less money or I'm going to not buy it. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. That accident was so minor that there was some dust on the back of the car that wasn't even disturbed. It wasn't... The car was tapped into, not even a fender bender. It was just, just like that. Just a, just a, just a kiss. Boom. Nothing. No damage. There was no paint damage to my car. Nothing. But yet, according to Carfax, my car was totaled. <laughs> Absolute bullshit, guys. I'm talking to you. You're in trouble. This is not okay. Anyway, did this affect my trade-in value when I got rid of the car a little bit later? You think it would, because it would. Now, of course, you got the little self-righteous piece of shit fox saying, Yeah, oh, look at this, rear end damage. No, there's no rear end damage. There was no damage to this car. And then we get to the interesting part. So, while they're reporting a rear-end damage, what they're not reporting is an insurance claim. This car had an insurance claim on it. Now, as far as I know, insurance companies don't report to Carfax because they work for the client, me. Um, but body shops do, I believe. Some do. So... What, all right. I don't know what year it was, but one of the summer it was it was in the summer. And I'm driving home. I was in the woods, and a box truck was in front of me, and he was probably drunk or on the phone, and he swerved, hit the cur hit the shoulder, and hit a a small rock about that big. About yay big, about the size of a small bowling ball, like a like a candle pin bowling ball. If you if you're from the Northeast, candle pin balls are like about that big. So he hits this rock, and I see it coming to me, and I'm like, well, I can't, I'm not gonna. It's, it's coming across the road diagonally, so there's not really a lot I can do to avoid this bowling ball coming towards my car. So I just squinted and ran over it. There wasn't really much else I could do. There were cars coming from the other direction, so crossing the yellow line wasn't an option. It wasn't at the point where it was coming to me. I couldn't go into the shoulder because it would still hit me. And slamming on the brakes wasn't a good option either. So hitting the ball, the rock, was at the time the most logical option. So I did. And it 
felt like some, it, 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 it didn't feel good. It felt pretty bad. I, um, I drove the car home. I was actually almost home. It didn't, I didn't lose control. I guess, ba boom, kind of like that. And it is what it sounded like, exactly like that. Drove home and I gave the car a thorough undercarriage inspection with a flashlight. It was broad daylight, so it was not a big deal. And um, it, it, so what it did was it, it scratched the bumper underneath. It hit, it missed the plastic radiator support somehow. And it hit the subframe. So it must have bounced off the road and struck the subframe. It dented the subframe. Then it rolled underneath the, the driver's side control arm and it dented the creases in the metal all along. And then it exited the other side. So all in all, not serious damage, but because the car was only a couple years old, I decided I should at least call my insurance company and have it inspected. Make sure the car is safe for the road. That's why I have insurance. So I brought it to a body shop. The um, adjust, claims adjuster showed up and we looked at the car. I said, look, if it doesn't need to be repaired, we'll leave it as is. If you think that the subframe is compromised, it was dented pretty good. And I said, if you think the subframe is compromised, I have insurance on the car. We'll pay for a new subframe and be done with it. I was given two options. The insurance company claims adjuster said, we, we will replace the subframe if you decide to move forward. And, but he, she said that it would be with a used part. And I said, well, I don't want a used subframe on my car. Um, I've never heard of insurance companies doing used parts, but whatever. We agreed to just leave it alone. The, uh, the, the body shop said, you know, this is totally fine. Um, you know, it wasn't rusted or anything, so there was no structural compromise uh, rust there or anything like that. So we left it alone. I said, you know what, let's just close the claim. We're done here. No big deal. Didn't count against me. We're good. And then about a week later, I got a check in the mail for $1,000 from the insurance company. I called them up and I said, what's, why? <laughs> why, why do I have a check for a thousand bucks? They said, well, you did open the claim and we settled the claim for $1,000. They said, well, I didn't agree to that, but I'll happily take your money. So I cashed the check. Bottom line, not on the Carfax. Moving on. So I kept the car until the transmission. So transmission number three started to slip and slam into reverse. You put it in reverse and it just boom. That's what it was doing. At about 89,000 miles is when that occurred. And that's when I got rid of it. Um, so it was then sold to its second owner in 2015. And they drove the car until it hit 140, let's see. I see owner number two here. Owner number two. I had a recall. And owner number two. So they owned it until apparently 11-23-23. Or no. Yeah, yeah. So 11-23-23. And the car was in another collision, this time on the driver's side front. Or was it? We'll never know. Um, doesn't say severe damage. It just says damage to left front. Now, by this point, this car is 13 years old. And you think a 13-year-old Elantra GLS that's had five fucking transmissions replaced. <laughs> They're going to scrap the car, right? No. It was sold probably, it was probably traded in or sold at auction. They probably said, you know what, we don't want this anymore. It's got 171,000 miles on it. And they sold the car December 4th of 23. It was registered in Franklin, New Hampshire, which is not exactly the, um, the epicenter of prosperity, uh, if, you, if you catch my drift. It was registered 
passed inspection at 179,000 miles, it was sold to owner number four just about a month ago. 111 2024, 179,189 miles in Newport, New Hampshire, of all places. So, I had this car written off a long time ago. I'm thinking there is no way on planet Earth that this car is still on the road today. Well, I will eat crow because guess what? <laughs> it's still on the road. And it's been in another collision. So that's three collisions, one that wasn't reported. No less than three or four transmissions. Um, and more warranty work than any other vehicle. I mean, we're talking like Land Rover level warranty repairs here. Crazy. Now, we get to the fun stuff. The Hyundai Elantra GT. This was the holy, this was the best car I have ever owned. The Elantra GT was one generation newer than the GLS that I had. And the ownership experience was completely different in such a positive way. This car had one warranty repair for a, um, I believe it was the EVAP purge valve had gone bad in it, which is a common problem. It happens. It happens to the best of cars. Now, I bought it new. I owned it for quite a while. I bought it um, on, uh, da, 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 da. it sat, now this was actually on the dealer lot for about six months before I bought it. It was already a, it was already an older model when I, when I ended up buying it, uh, but it was brand new. So I bought it on November 24th of 2014. I remember that day pretty well. It was a cold it was when things started getting kind of chilly. It was uh, my my parents' uh, 30th anniversary that year, um, or that week, that week, yeah. And then one of my best friends actually came, unbeknownst to me and unbeknownst to him, we both bought the exact same car within about two days of each other at the same dealer. I bought mine, and then like a day later, he bought one. Identical. We didn't even know it. We're like, hey, I bought a new car. He's like, wait, so did I. <laughs> What'd you bet? What'd you buy? I bought a silver Elantra GT. So did I. <laughs> what are the odds? He got the manual version, though. I got the automatic. He got the manual. So here we are. Just a lot of um, just a lot of service records because I get I had my my cars typically are serviced at the dealer for. Um, pretty much everything because I haven't found a local shop that I can trust yet. I'm still looking. Let me know when I find one. I'll, I'll let you know. Um, so I own this car for some time. I put a whopping 100. So I drove it for a hundred and how about 105,000 miles. I had no issues with this car. It was reliable. It was just, it was not, but it wasn't a very comfortable car to drive. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't very, it wasn't a nice car, but it had a lot of nice features. It had heated leather interior. It had, um, you know, it had XM. Ooh. <laughs> it had, um, it was the sport model. So it had the stupid sport wheels on it that would bend. I bent four rims on this car just because of New Hampshire potholes, but it was a good car. You know, I never had a mechanical issue, never had an electrical issue in 105,000 miles. And that's, that actually speaks pretty well for Hyundai, at least at that point. And, um, and the funny thing is the 2.0 liter um, new engine, that's NU, the Greek new, um, it was not known for reliability or longevity. Uh, those engines are not the most robust. 
so to speak. I even had GDI induction service done on this car faithfully. And maybe that that's what contributed to it. But of course that is not on the maintenance reports. Is it? Emissions, fluids, antifreeze. Induction system serviced. It is on it is on the Carfax. Okay. Fair enough. So anyway, I had this car for a while. I loved it, but I had just bought a house. I wanted something a little bigger, so I bought the Santa Fe. Um, Santa Fe. Yeah, I bought the Santa Fe Sport to replace it. I had such a good experience with this car. I decided, you know what? I'm going to go in spring for a a used Santa Fe Sport because I needed something that I could use to haul things in. I needed a small SUV. The hatchback just wasn't cutting it for me. Um, I kept having to borrow vehicles from people, which was getting annoying. Um, so I decided, you know what, let's just, let's just put this one to bed. The car was completely paid off, and I decided to go back into debt. So there we go. Um, love this car. I really did. I really did love this car as much as I didn't really love it. You know, it was like it was a good car when I needed a good car. So moving on, um, it was sold. It's had, as I said, once again, four owners. Um, four owners now. And according to Carfax, owner number two only put like, well, they bought it at 103. 105 or so, 105, 105, 184. They got rid of it just a couple years later with 114,000 miles. So they put about a little, little less than 10,000, a little over 10,000 miles, no, less than 10,000 miles on it, 9,000 miles. In 2023, it was sold to owner number three according to Carfax, and they put all of a thousand miles on it. They sold it to owner number four in May 5th of 2023, where it's currently sitting at 115,110, and that was its last report. And um, so that, that doesn't mean the car is uh, off the road. What it means is it hasn't really been driven, apparently. Um, I see a title issue or updated and I don't see anything after that, like a like an estate inspection, maybe. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know if this car is in the road, come to think of it. It could be. It, it may have been crushed. We don't really know. Um, owner number four could be a salvage yard. It could be sitting in somebody's backyard somewhere. It's hard to say. But, um, you know, take that for what it's worth. Had a campaign, uh, uh, so 330 2021 there was a recall issued. It doesn't say that that recall was taken care of. Are there any open recalls? I don't think so. It would say that. Yeah, no recalls. No open recalls. So, all right. We're going to just assume it's still on the road. Butterscotch. <laughs> what is this thing in front of me? Oh, God, don't do what I think you're going to do. Okay, so our final vehicle on this, um, this, this list is my 2017 Hyundai Santa Fe Sport 2.4. I'm going to go out and say that I actually, every every Hyundai that I've owned, I have loved. I've enjoyed driving. They've been great to own. Even the Elantra GLS, which was a colossal piece of junk, it was a good car. It drove nice. I, I took it on some long trips. I, I just, I like them. Um, the Santa Fe Sport was no exception. It was a comfortable it was, well, completely different vehicle from the Elantra GLS, just obviously. It was a much heavier, larger, longer, taller vehicle. It's an SUV. Um, and it treated me pretty well throughout the ownership experience. I never really had any issues with it. I had just one warranty um, repair that was for the 
uh, rever that was for the 360 degree camera. Um, they had to replace the uh, driver's side mirror mounted camera, so that was done. And um, but overall, it was reliable. It got pretty poor gas mileage. It was a 2.4 liter. It was a small engine and a heavy chassis, so it worked pretty hard. The real issue that I had with the, the Santa Fe Sport was the engine was basically a ticking time bomb. And the sunroof cassette was starting to bind up. It had the panoramic sunroof option, which is something you should never get in a car. Um, it is a mistake. Don't do it. No matter what Instagram tells you, panoramic sunroofs are a no-go. Don't do it. Because they are known to spontaneously... Um, shatter, uh, which can injure you when all the glass starts coming down from the ceiling, um, like from the heavens above, and they can bind up unexpectedly. Uh, mine definitely did once or twice, and it was out of warranty by that point, and it was um, just one of those things that you just kind of have to hope it never happens uh, when it's raining <laughs> or, or something like that. But that having been said, it was a nice, pleasant driving vehicle, and I do kind of miss it. I actually miss that car. Um, I got rid of it. Uh, I only owned it for like two years. Oh, look at this. That's, all right, so let's start with the Carfax report. So last odometer reported at 76,301, which um, that's pretty low, but... So, uh, so first owner owned it for two years and three months. Second owner, me, owned it for two years and three months. We both had we both put thirty thousand miles on this car, and um, the third owner has owned it for one year, and they've put about sixteen thousand miles on it, which is pretty interesting. Um, you can see that it was well maintained all service history here. Um, it was sold at Grapponi Hyundai and Bo. Um, this was a now this particular vehicle was fully loaded. It had every conceivable option you can you can get in a Hyundai uh, Santa Fe Sport. Um, every single option that was available it had it. Um, it was it was like driving a Mercedes Benz. But unlike a Mercedes Benz, everything worked. <laughs> <laughs> pretty reliably, except for that one camera. Uh, this particular vehicle started off life as a lease, um, and that's one of the reasons I bought it. It was a well-documented lease. Um, it was well-maintained. I actually did some sleuthing. I discovered the original lessee was a woman who owns a pool service business, and this was her private vehicle. Um, and she took very good care of it. It was clean. It was. It was just. It was. It, it even smelled new when I bought it. But anyway, let's see what we got here. First purchased on. Let's see. It was shipped to the dealer on. It doesn't show. I'm thinking it was sold sometime between 120 of 17 and 39 of 17. So that, that checks out. It was pretty well maintained at the dealer by the lessee. And here we go. Sold as a certified pre-owned vehicle by a Hyundai certified dealer to me on 10-24-2019. There we go. And uh, it was registered, color noted as gray. I had a key made for it because one of the original remote fobs broke, which I have to do to my Mazda, by the way. Whoops, <laughs> I, I broke one. Uh, and they're $400, by the way. So if you lose a key fob or break one, yeah, open your wallet. Vehicle service, service, service. The only problem I had with this car was towards the end of my ownership experience, I had the windshield replaced because it cracked. So this car had a heated windshield. So they call that the, um, the windshield wiper defroster or de-icer. It's a neat option, uh, but the problem is 
I think some cold water dripped down on top of it as it was heating up and it cracked it spontaneously. It had already been replaced before, probably for the same fucking reason. Um, it was on its second windshield when I got it. Nonetheless, it had to be replaced again. So, um, when I had it replaced, the uh, de-icer option never worked again. It just didn't work. Um, so, I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so, I brought it back to the windshield shop. This time, they replaced it again, and they chipped the paint, and they also got, like, grease spots, or, I'm sorry, uh, adhesive all over my interior. Um, I just said to hell with it, and I just said, you know what, we're done, we're done. Shortly after that, I traded it in. Now, I traded it in because the engine, like I said before, was kind of a ticking time bomb. It's not a matter of if, but it's a matter of when your Hyundai Theta 2 engine will blow up. And what was happening at the time was uh, kind of a, they were dealing with supply chain issues. It was the tail end of the pandemic, and I heard people having to wait months for a use, or sorry, for a replacement engine from Hyundai. And I decided I didn't want to be um, stuck without a vehicle uh, for months, because I knew mine would eventually fail. And I was like, you know what, let's just get rid of this thing. But here's the thing. And I don't care what Dave Ramsey says, but when you're able to sell a used vehicle for what you paid for it, do it. Uh, <laughs> I paid twenty thousand. I got a I got a bargain on this thing, but I paid twenty thousand and I sold it for eighteen five. Two years and thirty thousand miles later, so it cost me like fifteen hundred dollars to own this car for two years. Um, to me, that sounded like a no-brainer, slam dunk, let's do it. I'll never be able to do that again. That'll never happen. So I, I kind of struck the iron while it was hot, and I bought myself a brand new 2022 um, Mazda CX-5, which I love. I own that now, and it's a better vehicle than any Hyundai I've ever owned. Now let's get to the good stuff. Where is it now? Well, it is on its third owner where it lives a life in snowy Maine, Skowhegan, Maine, at 66, uh, 70, 76,301 miles. It is being maintained at a Walmart service center near you. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, crazy, huh? Um, yep, yeah, it is being serviced at a Walmart. So good luck to you. I hope the engine never blows up, and I hope you keep accurate and concise records. That ends our video for today. Have a good one. And um, you never know what you might find out when you start cyber-stalking your ex-vehicles, because um, there were some surprises here. And in conclusion... I can't believe my Elantra GLS is still a registered vehicle. It just doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, that car was a piece of junk when I bought it, despite the fact that I liked it. You can like something that sucks, you know. Um, and it's still going. It's still going. I, I just can't believe it. The Murano, that was another one. Like, how on earth did somebody squeeze 222,000 miles out of that piece of crap? Like, and why? Why and how? I don't understand. Like, I will never understand that. Um, but thank you for watching and have a great day.